In this video, we're gonna talk about viruses. These are interesting little things because they're not technically considered living organisms, but they can infect us and they can make us sick and they can evolve. Viruses are not composed of cells. They are very tiny protein capsules that have genetic material. Living things, their genetic material is always DNA, but in viruses, they can have RNA or DNA as their hereditary material. And that nucleic acid can actually be either single-stranded or double-stranded. So there are viruses that have single-stranded DNA. Viruses can change their nucleic acid, whether it's RNA or DNA, and that can change how they bind and infect cells. So even though they're not considered living things, they have a few properties of living things. Viruses have been around since organisms have been around. Um, the first single-celled organisms populated Earth starting about three and a half billion years ago. Nobody knows exactly when the first viruses started to evolve, but there are now viruses that infect every single living organism on Earth, from bacteria to fungus, plants and animals. If we look here at this diagram, we can see a red blood cell is about 10 micrometers. Remember that human cells can be anywhere from 10 to 20 micrometers on average. The largest human cell, which is an egg cell, is 100 micrometers. There are 1,000 micrometers in one millimeter. A bacterial cell can be less than one micrometer, and some of them can be two to five micrometers. So different bacteria can be different sizes. This is showing a very small one. This is 750 nanometers. There are 1,000 nanometers in one micrometer. So these are extremely small. Tobacco mosaic virus was one of the very first ones ever discovered. Here's a smallpox virus. A bacteriophage is a virus that can infect bacteria. And then to compare, here are ribosomes. Remember that ribosomes are organelles in our cells that help us to synthesize proteins. A polio virus is about the size of a ribosome. This diagram shows some examples of virus structures. And remember that viruses are not composed of cells. They do not have a cell membrane. They will be some combination of proteins and nucleic acids. This tobacco mosaic virus has this long cylindrical structure and it's an RNA virus. Adenovirus is a type of category of viruses that give us the common cold, and they have this sort of polyhedral shape with spike proteins. And then we have viruses that have this spherical structure. There is RNA inside. Oh, adenoviruses are DNA viruses, by the way. And sometimes they have an outer structure and an inner structure. So there are protein um, coat molecules inside, as well as having a protein sort of envelope. And these protein spikes that are on the surface are required for the virus to be able to bind to the cell that it's going to infect. A lot of viruses that infect humans have this spherical shape with proteins on the surface that bind to our cells. This one is an example of a bacteriophage. They kind of have this alien sort of structure. There's a head that contains the DNA and they have a tail with receptors that bind to the bacterial cell and then the genetic material is injected into the bacterial cell. And now we have COVID-19, which is a new virus that has been infecting people all over the world. And COVID is a type of coronavirus. Coronaviruses are also spherical and they have spike proteins. And they're called coronaviruses because under an electron microscope, they kind of look like they have a bit of a halo because of the shape and density of the spike proteins. So one of the main factors about viruses is that they have to bind to a very specific receptor on our cell membranes or 
a bacterial or plant or animal cell membrane. Viruses are usually very, very specific. They can't infect a cell that they don't have a receptor for. So how viruses make us sick depend in large part on which kind of cell that they are infecting. In this diagram, we can see an example of a typical structure of a virus. This could be a common cold, it could be influenza or herpes or HIV, and there are antigens on the surface. Antigens are proteins and they have to bind to specific proteins on our cells called receptors. If the antigen and the receptor don't match, that virus cannot infect that cell. If the antigen and the receptor does match, then when binding occurs, the cell will engulf the virus through endocytosis. And then the virus can enter the cell and now this cell is infected. And then the virus will use the cell's organelles and energy and proteins and amino acids and it will replicate itself and build all kinds of new virus particles. The virus antigens have to match the host cell receptor. And different viruses bind to different kinds of receptors. So for example, hepatitis is a virus that only infects liver cells. Common cold and influenza viruses only infect epithelial cells in usually in our upper airways and respiratory tract. Noroviruses will infect gastrointestinal cells. HIV will infect immune cells. So different kinds of viruses infect different kinds of cells depending on the type of receptor that the cell has. With influenza, there are two important molecules on influenza viruses. One of them is called hemagglutinin, and that is the molecule on the influenza virus that binds to our epithelial cells and allows it to infect those cells. The other molecule that is important is neuraminidase. This is an enzyme that allows the influenza viruses to repackage themselves so that they can leave the cell and spread. So the H from hemagglutinin and the N from neuraminidase give influenza viruses their name, like H1N1 or H5N1. So different influenza viruses have different hemagglutinin and neuraminidase molecules. How are viruses transmitted? There are multiple ways that a virus can be transmitted from one organism to another. One way is through airborne or droplets. Droplets would be anything like mucus or saliva, and they will enter the body through breathing. We can also transmit things through objects. So let's suppose you have a cold and you cough into your hand and then you touch a doorknob. The virus particles that you have coughed into your hand, you can transfer them to the doorknob and then those virus particles can stay there for a period of time. And it varies depending on the kind of virus. Some don't last very long, a few hours, maybe a couple of days. Some can maybe last three to five days. And then if someone else comes along and touches the doorknob, then the virus particles can move onto their hand. And then if they touch their face, then they can inhale some of those virus particles. So we can sometimes transmit things through objects and common colds in the flu are easily transmitted through this method. Sometimes things are transmitted through the oral fecal route and then this would infect the GI tract either through consuming food or water that is contaminated. Aerosols can sometimes, like dust, can sometimes contain fecal matter that can be inhaled. A cool example is that sometimes viruses are found in rodent droppings. And if they live in a barn where there's food and then say somebody sweeps the floor and the mouse droppings can go into the air. And then if you inhale that, then you can get sick. Sometimes viruses are transmitted through skin contact. An example would be cold sores, which is the herpes virus. 
Sometimes they're transmitted through blood or body fluids like saliva, urine, and semen. One example would be HIV, which is transmitted sexually and also through blood, either through contaminated needles or open skin, and even sometimes during childbirth. And then lastly, some viruses can be transmitted through vectors. A vector would be some organism that carries the virus, like ticks or mosquitoes. Like West Nile virus is carried by mosquitoes. A couple other interesting things about viruses. So I've talked about how they're very specific. They have antigens or proteins on their surface that bind to our protein receptors, and then the cell takes in that virus particle. But sometimes viruses can infect multiple species. When this occurs, it is called a zoonotic infection. An example would be influenza. Influenza can infect birds like ducks and chickens, and also pigs and also humans. When viruses can infect multiple organisms, they tend to have a higher mutation rate. So when viruses are new, they're more likely to make us sicker. The other kind of virus that can mutate faster are RNA viruses. When an RNA virus infects a cell, it often will have to convert its RNA into DNA, then replicate, then make RNA again, make all the virus proteins, repackage themselves, and then leave the cell and go infect other cells. That RNA to DNA transition sometimes increases the mutation rate because there's an enzyme that is used in certain ones called retroviruses like HIV, where there's an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And that enzyme is not super accurate. It makes mistakes. So there are always little nucleotide changes that are created every time those viruses replicate. Okay, this is why it's difficult to come up with a vaccine for HIV because they're always a little bit changing. When we replicate DNA, we use an enzyme called DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase has this special feature called proofreading ability. So DNA polymerase will sometimes notice that it made a mistake and it will back up, cut out the mistake, and then keep going. So DNA polymerases are a little bit better at replicating DNA without mistakes. So DNA viruses tend to not mutate quite as rapidly. RNA polymerase doesn't have proofreading ability, so more mutations can occur, means more changes can happen in that type of virus. Here are some examples of different viruses that are either RNA viruses or DNA viruses. When a virus infects our cell, I've talked about how it has to have antigens, it has to bind to a receptor. There are basically four steps that occur when a virus infects a cell. So we'll go through those steps. Number one, the virus has to attach. That means the antigen has to match the receptor. Then it will infiltrate. That means it is going inside the cell. When the virus binds to a receptor, it triggers the cell to cause endocytosis or phagocytosis, and it will engulf the virus particle and bring it into the cell. Then the virus has to replicate. When the virus replicates, it's going to use all of the host cells stuff, the nutrients, the energy, the amino acids, all of the things that it needs to replicate. Viruses can never replicate outside of a cell. And then the last step is assembly, where the new virus particles are formed. And then when they are released from the cell, so then we make all kinds of new virus particles, and it is going to break open the cell and it will kill the host cell in the process. And then all these new virus particles can go and infect a nearby new cell. So the process that I just described, it has a name. It's actually, it's called the lytic cycle. Lysis means to break open a cell. 
Okay, so a lytic cycle means that the virus particles are going through the steps that I just talked about, and it's going to break open the cell and kill the host cell, and all those new virus particles then go and infect more cells. There's another way that viruses can replicate, and we call that the lysogenic cycle. In this example, we're going to look at the lytic and lysogenic cycle of a bacteriophage infecting a bacterial cell. So this is a phage virus, and it is going to inject its DNA into the cell. So you can see the viral DNA is red and the bacterial DNA is blue. When the viral DNA is inserted into the cell and it goes through the lytic cycle, the virus is going to use the machinery of the cell and assimilate new viral proteins, make new virus particles, and then it's going to break open the cell and release all of the new viruses that can then go infect another cell. When we go through the lysogenic cycle, the phage is going to insert its DNA, just like in the beginning, but now instead of creating new virus particles, that viral DNA is going to be integrated into the bacterial DNA. Then that bacterium is going to replicate and every time it replicates, it's going to also replicate the viral DNA. And this process can go on for a long period of time until at some point it will enter the lytic cycle and create new virus particles. There are a couple of viruses that infect humans that have a similar kind of life cycle. So think about a couple of viruses that maybe come and go that never completely go away, that our immune system can never completely get rid of, right? So one example would be cold sores, herpes viruses, genital herpes is the same. So those virus particles spend part of the time integrated into our DNA. And then the lytic phase is when you can see the sores. Another example is HIV. HIV will incorporate its DNA into our cells. And so you can have this long period we call sometimes latency where you don't have symptoms. We have symptoms when it moves into the lytic cycle. HIV has a molecule on its surface called GP120. That is the antigen that is going to bind with the receptor on our cells. On our cells, HIV binds to cells that have a CD4 receptor. CD4 receptors are on immune cells. There are a few different kinds of immune cells that have CD4 receptors, like macrophages and helper T cells. When HIV binds the GP120 to our CD4, it is engulfed into the cell through endocytosis. HIV is an RNA virus, and it is a retrovirus, so it has reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that will convert RNA into DNA. Then it will make a double-stranded DNA molecule that will incorporate itself into our immune cell DNA. And it can stay here for a really long time. Eventually, it will come out, form new HIV RNA, it will use our ribosomes to synthesize proteins, and then those proteins will be packaged into new HIV virus particles. Now there's two things that can happen. Number one, HIV can bud from an immune cell, which means it will form a new virus particle and leave the immune cell without killing the immune cell. It, when it's budding from the cell, it will just be released and now this HIV can go infect another immune cell. Or, number two, it can cause lysis, which means it will kill the immune cell. When HIV goes through this lysis phase with helper T cells, this is when we can become severely immunocompromised. So I put a few different viruses into a chart so that we can summarize it. HIV. HIV infects immune cells, primarily helper T cells. 
they will infect cells that have the CD4 receptor. HIV is an RNA virus. It's considered a retrovirus because its RNA is converted into DNA. And opportunistic infections are the main problem once the person becomes immunodeficient. So in the 80s, people died from HIV. It was very scary infection when it first came about because there were no treatments. Now there are antiviral treatments and many people have effective treatment to live normal lifespans. Then we have common cold viruses, rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, respiratory syncytial virus, and coronaviruses. These all cause varying degrees of the common cold. There are a couple of varieties of coronavirus that cause runny nose and sneezing kind of colds, just like rhinoviruses. But there are a couple of coronaviruses, like COVID that we have going on right now, that can cause SARS, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome. With respiratory syncytial virus, this can be dangerous for newborns. All of these viruses infect respiratory tract epithelial cells and they bind to some receptor. Each virus has its own kind of receptor that it will bind to. There are at least a hundred that are circulating all the time and symptoms range from mild to severe. And again, it depends on the state of the immune system of the person that's being infected. Influenza. There are three different types of influenza, A, B, and C. Type A and B are the most common. They are RNA viruses, so they mutate. And just like the common cold, they cause symptoms that usually involve respiratory symptoms like coughing, but influenza virus usually also causes fever and body aches. So you can feel pretty terrible when you have the flu. And sometimes opportunistic infections like pneumonia can come in when your immune system is busy fighting the flu, then sometimes a viral or bacterial pneumonia can also come in and infect, which can be fatal. And influenza infects the respiratory tract as well. Herpes we've talked about can cause cold sores and genital herpes, and it has a latent phase. So herpes infects the skin. And when the virus is in its latent phase, it is actually inside of sensory neurons. Chickenpox is actually also a herpes virus. It's, it's in the same family. And chickenpox can do the same thing and it can stay in the sensory neurons. And sometimes it can be reactivated if somebody has a low immune response or like stress, having huge amounts of stress inhibits the immune system. So these kinds of things can come out at that time. And people that have had chickenpox in the past can sometimes have a recurring infection called shingles. Human papillomavirus. This one causes warts. There are at least a hundred different strains of human papillomaviruses and they infect specifically the keratinocytes in the skin and they can be transmitted through skin contact or through sexual contact. There are two strains of HPV that have been linked with cervical cancer in women. And this is why women should have pap tests to make sure there is no dysplasia going on. And actually an interesting thing about the two strains of HPV that can cause cervical cancer, they don't cause warts to form. There are some HPV viruses that don't actually cause warts to form. So just because you've never had actual warts doesn't mean you haven't had HPV. HPV is very prevalent. Lots of people have had different strains of HPV. Hepatitis infects the liver. There are five different kinds of hepatitis. Most of the time, type A and E are through contaminated food or water. Remember how we talked about the oral fecal route of transmission. Hepatitis B is one of the main ones that healthcare professionals should be maybe concerned about because this is very easily transmitted through blood and body fluids. So anybody working in emergency situations that will be in contact with blood and body fluids will probably get a vaccine for hepatitis B.
Symptoms can be mild to severe, but they're generally severe. Hepatitis is not a fun infection. And one of the main symptoms is jaundice. One of the main things that our liver does is it breaks down a molecule called bilirubin, which is produced from breaking down red blood cells. So our red blood cells have hemoglobin and the heme molecule has to be broken down, it becomes bilirubin. It has a yellow pigment. And normally in the liver, that yellow pigment is put into the bile that is released into the small intestine. We use bile to break down fat when we're digesting food, but the liver also dumps things into the bile that's a waste product. And it'll go into the small intestine and then just go out with the waste in the digestive tract. So that yellow molecule goes into the bile. It's also why sometimes if you've thrown up really hard and it's bright yellow, that's bile. So that yellow pigment, we normally get rid of it through the digestive tract, but if the liver's not functioning properly, it can't do that. So then that yellow pigment can build up and it will be visible in the whites of your eyes and in your skin, and that is called jaundice. So anytime someone has liver failure, liver cancer, liver infections, the liver is not functioning properly, jaundice is a main symptom. And our last two examples, rotavirus. This is an extremely common diarrhea infection in children. It infects the GI tract. It usually causes vomiting and diarrhea, usually for a couple of days. Almost every child is infected with this at some point in time in their first five years of life, and usually adults are immune. We usually don't get it again. It's not a kind of virus that mutates rapidly. So it's generally harmless, but in children that are either malnourished or have poor sanitation, don't have clean water to drink, don't have good health care, it can be fatal. And then the last virus that's very, very common is called mono or mononucleosis, and the virus is an Epstein-Barr virus. And this virus infects B cells, which are one of the types of immune cells, and it can also infect our epithelial cells. This one is easily transmitted through saliva. Many, many people are infected with Epstein-Barr virus, and this one is interesting because usually the younger you are, the less severe the symptoms. And as you get older, then the symptoms can be worse. Sometimes people maybe get it when they're a teenager, and then you can have fatigue for three months, and it can feel bad for a long time. So again, symptoms can vary from mild to you don't even notice that you've had it, to very severe and you have recurring fatigue for a long time. Epstein-Barr, usually causes a fever and a sore throat and just fatigue is the main, main symptom. And then the interesting thing about this is that it has been associated with an increased risk of some autoimmune diseases, mostly multiple sclerosis and lupus.